As I mentioned in my, the little testimony I shared, I've been looking a lot into to history and, and archaeology. And so I wanted to share about what I believe is one of the most important Christian duties that we have. And that's why I've entitled the message today, A, a Christian Duty. And I want to open with 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. This is going to be the text that we're going to be looking at today. I'll go ahead and read it for us. It says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so I want to break this down into five different parts to this verse that I find extremely important and that I think will help us better not only understand the verse, but better apply the verse to our lives. Because what is Christianity if it's not practical? We don't want just a theory for our religion. We want something that's practical, something that we can apply in our daily lives. And so first off, I want us to look at the prerequisite. In the opening part of this verse, God gives us the prerequisite. We are told, but sanctify the Lord God where? In your heart. And the key word that I want us to focus in or on is the word sanctify. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to sanctify? Apart. To set apart, yes. We're told that the seventh day was what? Sanctified. Sanctified. It was set apart. So this is telling us that God wants us to have him set apart where? In our heart. In our heart. And that, that verb is interesting because it's, it's in what's called the imperative mood. Anyone here familiar with the imperative mood? Knows a little bit about grammar? I don't see any hands going up. Well, the imperative mood is, is the mood that indicates command, it, hence imperative. If something is imperative, it's a must. Mm -hmm. And so when you speak in the imperative mood, it's, you're either giving a command or you're giving a plea. You're making a plea with someone. You're saying, please let this be or let this happen. For instance, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, another verse we're familiar with, it says, let this mind be in you. Again, the verb to let is in the imperative. And so it's, it's a plea or a command. And here, Peter is making a plea, as you will. And the plea is that we, as God's people, would sanctify God in our hearts. And this is the prerequisite for being able to give an answer if we want to give an answer for God, God needs to be sanctified in our hearts. He has to be set apart. We don't divide our heart, do we? No. A divided heart is an evil heart. Mm -hmm. Our heart and our eyes are to be single. When it says to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, it's to give him the heart. It's not just to set off a portion of our heart for him, but it's to give him the whole heart, all the affections of the heart, all the love of the heart, all the desires of the heart. Everything that flows from the heart is to be for God. It's to be dedicated to God, sanctified by God. You know, we are told in the book of Proverbs that out of the heart comes the issues of life. Everything that our life is made up of, all our feelings, our affections, our desires, our will, everything flows from the heart. And that's why God is to be sanctified there, so that that spring can be pure. And this is the prerequisite for giving an answer. Because if we want to glorify God, if we want to draw people to God, we have to have our heart such that there's no reserve that God has the first place. Because people are going to realize and catch on if, if we say one thing and do another. You realize that love is not only seen in words, but it's seen in deeds. It's seen in actions. And that's why the heart first needs to be sanctified to God as the prerequisite. The second part that I want to note is the state of mind. 
And this will be the result of the prerequisite, the state of mind. Notice this next section. It says that we're to be in a state of what? Readiness. Readiness. Be ready how often? Always. Always. So this is talking about a state of mind. For instance, if I were at this moment to drop a math quiz on you, would you be ready? Some of you probably would. Those of you who have math on the mind would be ready, wouldn't you? But if someone to ask you about your hope and faith in the Word of God, would you be ready? Is the Word of God on your mind? Is His honor and glory on your heart? Is that burden there? Hence you see the state of mind that we must be in. And if God is sanctified in the heart, this will be the result. We will always be ready to give an answer, not for us, but for Him to draw people to him. As John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that will be the focus. That will be the state of mind. We need to be in a state of readiness. And that that word or noun readiness in the original implies preparation. You can't be ready for something if you haven't prepared. For instance, we know as the sixth day of the week, in the biblical language, is called the preparation preparation day. It prepares us to be ready for Sabbath. We can't be ready without preparation. Now, it's true that preparation has to take place on all the six days of the week. Mm -hmm. We can't just wait until Friday to do all of our preparation. Preparation should be taking place that when the Sabbath day comes, all that we have Uh, set our minds to do or all that we have on our schedule to do needs to be done. We don't want to have any loose ends so that our mind is distracted about, oh, I haven't done this or, oh, I need to do that. You can't be in a state of readiness if you have that to enter into the Sabbath. And so it is in giving an answer. We need to be prepared. We need to have the Word of God stored in the heart. There needs to be preparation work done in order to be ready. And a couple verses that I want us to note. The first is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Fourth chapter and verse 16. Here Paul admonished Timothy saying, Take heed unto whom? Thyself. What does it mean to take heed? Be careful. Okay, be careful. Be Be thoughtful, thoughtful, right? Be attentive to. Would you agree? that sound right? Be attentive to something? Mm -hmm. So we are to be attentive to what? Does he say, take heed to others? No, he says, take heed to whom? Thyself. Thyself. We need to be aware of our own selves. As the psalmist says, search me and try me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We need to be searching our hearts, Take heed to ourselves, as Paul admonishes Timothy. But notice, it doesn't finish there. It says, and unto what? The doctrine. The doctrine. So not only we're to take heed to ourselves, but we're to take heed to the doctrine or the teaching. And it continues, we are to continue continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and what? Them Them that hear thee. Now, when you give an answer, you intend for it to be heard. So when we give our answer, it needs to be with that preparation, and that preparation will result in the salvation to the hearer if the preparation has been made. You see, if we will take heed unto ourselves and to the doctrine, the teachings that God has given us in His Word, we will be prepared to give an answer to the saving of souls. Jesus, his lips were prepared morning by morning to feed the hungering and the thirsting. Jesus was daily before his father, especially in the early parts of the morning, Mm -hmm. seeking for that daily bread to give to those that are hungering. And so should we. 
we should be seeking for something to share with others. And that preparation will result in salvation. It's a promise. For we're told that if we continue in these things, continue in self-examination and in examination of the Word of God, we will be prepared to give that answer so that the hearers will be saved. Not only ourselves, but those that hear us. Now notice second epistle to Timothy. This time chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 14. Second Timothy 3, verse 14. And we read, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Again, you see the verb continue. Same verb with the same implication. We are told to continue in examining ourselves, taking heed to ourselves, and to taking heed to the word of God or the doctrine. Here we are told to continue in the things which we have what? Learned. Learned. Whether it be at church, whether it be in our own personal studies, those things that we have learned from the word of God, we are to continue in them. And we are told that if we continue in them, that, uh, notice here, verse, let's skip down to verse 16. Another well-known verse. Paul says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now notice verse 17. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto how many good works? All All good works. Is is there anything lacking in this book? No. No. It's given to make us perfect. It's given to thoroughly furnish us for the work that is before us. God wants us to be prepared. And he says that if we will continue in the things that we have learned in the word of God, and that doesn't just mean mulling them around in our head, but acting them out, bringing them into the life work, that if we will continue and abide in these things, that we will be perfected and we will be furnished or prepared for every good work. And that's what God wants for us. Amen? Amen. Part number three to this verse. First Peter 3.15. The task. We've looked at the prerequisite, that which is required. We've seen the state of mind. And now I want us to look at the third part, which is the task. And notice that it goes in that order. God is a God of order. Mm -hmm. What is the task? To give an answer. First of all, I want us to look at the word answer. Because this word answer in the original isn't just any answer. It's very specific type of answer. It's the Greek word uh, apologia or apologia. It comes from two words. The preposition apo, which means from, and logia, which is reason. And the word in the original literally implies a defense. It's where we get the theological term apologetics. How many here have heard of the term apologetics? Well, it doesn't mean that they're apologizing. Because we use the word apology in a sense of saying sorry. But that is not at all what this word means in the original language. It means to give a defense. It means to give a reason based upon something. Hence the preposition from. We are drawing a reason from something. So when somebody asks you a question, your answer is to be based upon the question. Not necessarily what they are asking. But you'll notice a lot of times that Jesus didn't always answer the exact question that was asked. He answered to the need. He saw what the real need was. 
for instance, when Nicodemus came to him and, and said, you know, we, we know that thou art a, a teacher come from God. And what did, what did Jesus say? What was his answer or reply? He said, verily, verily, I, I say unto thee, you shall not see heaven. No man shall see heaven except he be what? Born again. He got right to the root of the problem. And that is an apology. That's what apologetics is intended to do, to give an answer, to meet the need. And also, it means to give a defense. Because, as we'll note here in just a, a moment, we're to give an answer for a reason. And we'll see that, that God not only wants us to give just any old reason, but he wants us to give a defense. And when we, when we prepare to give a defense for something, it requires, as I mentioned before, preparation. Are you going to be able to defend if you haven't prepared? For instance, and, and I was thinking about this, if, if I were to ask you a number of doctrinal questions, there's a good chance that you would be prepared to give an answer. You know, why do you believe in the Sabbath? Why do you believe in not eating meat? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior? Why do you believe in baptism, in the necessity of baptism? If I were to ask you these basic questions, you would probably be prepared to give an answer to defend why you, why you believe that, to give a good reason why you believe that. But if I were to ask you a question based on historical points within the Bible, like, why do you believe that there is an exodus? Why do you believe that they actually crossed the Red Sea? Do you actually believe there's a Mount Sinai? Do you actually believe that Noah was on an ark? Why? Would your answer be, well, the Bible says so? Or would you be prepared to give an answer? See, God wants us to be an intelligent people, to know what we believe and why we believe it. A lot of times we're prepared to give an answer when it comes to theological things. But the Bible is more than just a book of theology. It's a historical document as well. Mm -hmm. And it documents history from the beginning of our history to the end. And God wants us to be well acquainted with that history and to be prepared to give an answer of the hope that is within us. Do we believe these things? Well, the person who asks you the question is going to want to know why you believe it. And if all we can answer is, well, the Bible says so, most often we're going to be labeled as a cult. Well, that's, well, they just believe the Bible. But why do you believe the Bible would be my next question. What proof, what evidence is there that verifies that statement in the Bible? Isn't that a reasonable question? It's a fair question that deserves an answer. And God wants us to be prepared to give that answer. And that's one of the things that came upon, a burden that came upon my heart just this last week, looking at the history, looking at the archaeological discoveries. God is unveiling truth. He's unveiling evidence for us to be able to present to those who are going to ask us these very questions so that we can be prepared to give an answer of why we believe these things. Not simply because the Bible says so, although to me that's a good reason, but to the unbeliever, it's not a good reason. We want to give them something that they can put their faith in that will draw them and lead them to faith in the Word of God. Their basis of their faith is not the Word of God, and that's where we want to bring them. We want to give them evidence to bring them 
so that they can have faith and confidence in these things. And so I want to encourage us, take advantage of the time and opportunities we have to educate ourselves in scientific lines, whether it be math or biology or whatever it may be. Study to show yourself approved, not unto men, but unto God, that you can give an answer for your faith in these things. Science proves the Word of God. Math reveals the Word of God. All these things that we study in school glorify God, if properly understood. And God wants us to be able to give an answer for Him. Not just so we can pass a test and get a job and get, a, get an education just so we can make a living in this world. Our education should be for the glory of God. And that's why Peter is admonishing us to be prepared to give that answer. And so, the more well-rounded of an education that we have, the better it is. The more prepared we will be to give that answer. Notice Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, we're going to begin in verse 20. I'm not going to read all of these verses. And it says, And these men, they watched him, and sent forth spies which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And here it gives an instance of these men asking Jesus a question that they had prepared ahead of time. You know, is it lawful to give tribute? Today it would be like asking the question, you know, is it lawful for a Christian to pay taxes? If you say yes, well, you're going to be condemned from one side. And if you say no, well, you're going to be condemned from the other side. And Jesus knew that. He understood the real point of the question. And that's what apologetics is intended to do, to understand the real underlying question and answer that. And Jesus saw the real underlying issue. And notice his response to this. Verse 23, he says, Why tempt ye me? He says, Show me a penny. And if I were to hand you a penny and ask you the question, Whose image and superscription hath it? What would your response be? Oh, it has the president. It has his image stamped on it, doesn't it? One of our presidents. Caesar, as it were, the state. What did Jesus say? Verse 25, and he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. You see, Jesus saw to the heart of the question, whose image and superscription hath this penny, or this money, this dollar bill, or this hundred dollar bill? Whose is it? Who does it belong to? Whose image does it have? Well, it has the state's image. Then Jesus said, give it to the state. But the things that belong to God are to be given to him. What about the Sabbath day? Whose image and superscription hath it? God's. To whom is it to be rendered? To God. You see, that's the point, the real issue, the question. Jesus answered the real issue, and that's what apologetics is intended to do. That's what our answer is intended to do. They were hoping that Jesus would simply say yes or no, because either way, they had him, and they knew it. If he said yes, then they would condemn him as disloyal to the Jewish nation. If he said no, then they would condemn him and turn him over to the Romans as a traitor. They had him either way. But Jesus answered in a way that foiled their plot. And that's, what, that's the kind of wisdom that God wants us to have. He wants us to have that answer. And notice the result. Verse 26 says, And they could not take hold of his words before the people. And they marveled at his answer and did what? They shut up. 
because they had nothing more to say. The gainsayers were put to silence. And that's what an answer is intended to do. And given in the way and manner and wisdom of Christ, it will do that very thing. It will silence the gainsayer. It will bring conviction to the heart. You remember when Jesus was in the temple and they brought to him the woman who had committed adultery and set, him, set her at his feet. They quoted the law. You know, we know what the law says should happen to this woman. But what sayest thou? Again, his answer shows that wisdom which is from above, that wisdom that God wants us to have in giving an answer. He said, which of you, in other words, is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. And who could cast the stone? There was one man alone who could cast the stone. Mm -hmm. And that was Jesus. But what did Jesus say? And he asked the woman, he said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? And she said, she looked around, she said, Well, there are none, Lord. And she said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see, Jesus could have cast a stone, but he didn't. You see the wisdom of his answer. Jesus was prepared to give an answer. Notice Titus chapter 1, verse 9. We've kind of touched on this. It says, holding fast the faithful word. What is that faithful word? It's the Bible. Holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. We're not simply to ridicule back. We're not to give ridicule for ridicule. But our answer is intended to convince. We are to present evidence. And notice the type of doctrine. Did you see that little word that's before the word doctrine? Yeah, it's an important adjective. Mm -hmm. What kind of doctrine is it? Sound. sound. What does it mean to be sound? A sound doctrine is a doctrine without flaw. Sound doctrine. When Christ taught, it was with sound doctrine. His enemies could find nothing in his speech that they could lay hold on. Nothing that they could use as evidence against him. And that is sound speech. That's the type of sound answer that God wants. He wants us to be able to convince the gainsayer, to silence them. Not just to put them to silence, but to cause them to think, to bring conviction to the heart. Notice, here's some other examples found in the word of God of this word apologia or apologia. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11, it's translated clearing of yourselves. Again, the connotation of defense. And in Philippians 1, 17, it is translated defense. A number of times Paul speaks about him giving a defense or making his defense. It's the same word. So we are called, when we are called to stand before the judges of this world to give an answer why we're keeping the Sabbath, why are we being stubborn and obstinate and un, unwilling to, to observe the laws of the land, are we going to be prepared to give a defense in that day? Well, if we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, yes. Number four, number four, we've looked at the task, now I want us to look at the reason or motive. And this is a part that is, I think, sometimes overlooked in this verse. Notice as we're to give an answer to whom? Every man. Every man. And, and we kind of just gloss over the part that follows. To every man that, what? asketh you. A lot of times when we have this desire in our heart, you know, 
we'll strike up a conversation. We like to talk at the drop of a hat, and we'll even drop the hat. We want to get the conversation rolling, get the conversation going. We initiate it. But that's not what this is about. This is not about initiating controversy. This is about when we are approached and asked deliberately of a reason of the hope that is within us. Why do you believe this? Why do you do this? Why do you behave this way? When they ask you for a reason, then you are to give an answer. But a lot of times we want to give that answer before we're even asked. Before that person ever shows any interest, we're ready to engage. But we are admonished here to give an answer only to those that ask us. If they come to us and they ask us, then they receive. Remember the parables that Christ taught? If you go back to Matthew chapter 13. After Christ told the parable of the sower and of the field, and it says, later his disciples came to him and asked him in private, why do you speak to them in parables? Why? Well, so that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not hear, because only those that come to me and ask will receive an answer. Blessed are your ears, because they hear. You are asking. You've come to me and asked. Therefore, you are receiving an answer. You see, if we want to know the meaning of these things, then we, we go and we ask. Jesus only gave answer to those that asked him. And that is how we are to be. We are to follow in his footsteps. And notice it says we are to give an an answer to everyone that asketh us a reason. And that reason literally means reason. It's the, the question it asked is intended to get a logical, reasonable response, not an emotional one. This is based on reason. They want to know why. And we are to place the evidence in a logical, reasonable, that will appeal to those of sense. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have feeling in, in the way that we present it, that there shouldn't be emotion involved. There is. Jesus often spoke with pathos, with feeling and emotion. But he was appealing not to the feelings, but he was appealing to the reason in his answers, trying to bring conviction to people. And so our answers ought to be as well. And so here, this is our fifth and last part of this verse that I want us to take a look at. The manner. We've seen the prerequisite. You know, we've looked at all these different aspects. Now I want us to look at the last one. This is the manner, the manner of the answer, and it's equally important. We are to give an, an answer, how? With meekness and what? Fear. And what does it mean to be meek? Humble. That's probably, I think, the most commonly understood definition of meek. However, it's not the meaning of meek. That's usually how we understand it, but that's not what the word meek means. The word meek literally means that which endures under provocation. That which is not easily provoked is meek. Moses was called the meekest of men. Why? because he endured the hardest of provocations for 40 years. He was provoked day in and day out for 40 years. The Bible calls him meek because his anger was not easily provoked. It took a lot to provoke Moses' anger, and when it finally did, it cost him entrance into Canaan. And God wants us to be meek in our answers. And when they ask a question, they may ask it in a provoking manner. They may ask it in a way to stir up your animosity. They may say it in a way that they know will rile you up. But we are not to give rise to that. We are to answer with meekness. 
and with what? Fear. And what kind of fear is that? Fear of the Lord. This is the manner of our answer. It's to be meek. It's not to be provoked. It's just sometimes, you know, we get onto our children or, or we get onto someone and there's that irritation in our voice. That's an indication to us that we're lacking meekness. Mm -hmm. uh, meekness is something very important when it comes to giving an answer. We want to have that meekness and we want to give it in fear. And the fear that we are to give it in is remembering that we too are men of like passions. We are to, to give that answer in fear, realizing that you know, we too have similar feelings and passions and we don't want to stir those up in others. We want to remember the golden rule. There's, there, you know, Therefore, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. That's the golden rule. We, wouldn't want, we don't want people to stir us up, so let's not stir them up. We want to have that fear, remembering that we are weak, and we don't want to prey upon weakness. Jesus never preyed upon weakness. He tried to encourage strength and faith and confidence, and so should we. Notice Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, let your speech be always with what? Grace. Grace. Seasoned with what? Salt. Salt. That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Essentially, Paul is saying the same thing that Peter was saying in 1 Peter 3.15 with meekness and fear, let our words be with grace, seasoned with salt. Just like when we add salt to food, it makes it pleasant to the taste. Our words should be seasoned so, so that they're, they're not going to incite anger or frustration or any of those wrong feelings in people. We want to be careful how we answer. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Notice what it says about love in verse 5. It says, It doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not what? What does that mean? It's meek. And Proverbs 15, 1, another one of my favorite verses. Now when somebody punches you in the nose, you don't generally respond with a soft answer, do you? No. But that's how we are to respond, with softness. It says, a soft answer does what? Turneth, Turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. anger. You see, when we reply in kind, it stirs up the same kind of feeling. And this is how arguments get started. A soft answer ends arguments. It turns it away. When a soft answer is given in reply to a hard statement or a provoking statement, it turns away that wrath. Notice verse 28 as well. Verse 28 says, The heart of the righteous studieth to what? Answer. He does what? He studies to answer. Are we, as I mentioned before, taking advantage of the time and opportunities we have to study and prepare to give that answer. Just if we knew that finals was coming up tomorrow, we'd probably all be caught off guard, wouldn't we? But if we'd been studying every day, finals would never catch us off guard. And this is what the Lord wants. We want to be studying to give an answer. But the contrary is, the mouth of the wicked Poureth out what? In, in other words, they're not prepared to give an answer. Most likely they're going to reply in kind. And our last text is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. There we read, Let us therefore, is that word? Fear. Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. We are to do what? To fear, to be afraid. 
a lot of times we look at fear as a bad thing. But fear is not always a bad thing. Sometimes fear is a good thing. And as I mentioned before, you know, if, if we're afraid of lions, that's a good thing. If we're afraid of walking on train tracks, that's a good thing. Afraid of jumping off tall buildings is a good thing. That type of fear will save you. And that's the fear that we want. We want to have that fear to displease God. If we will have that type of fear driving us and moving us and motivating us, God will bless. It will bring conviction to the heart of the listener. So let me conclude. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we're going to note verse, verse 7. It says, A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to what? Keep silence, Keep silence and a time to speak. speak. So is there a time to be quiet? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did Jesus answer every question? No. no. There were some questions he was silent. Mm -hmm. If you look in Matthew chapter 26 and onward, the story of Jesus' uh, trial before both the Sanhedrin and Pilate, there were certain times when Jesus was silent. He didn't answer every question. And you see that in his life. So there is a time to keep silence and there is a time to speak. And God wants us to have wisdom to know the signs of the times. When is the time to speak and when is the time to keep silence? And here I have the example of Matthew 26, verses 62 and 63 as an example. But let's here look at our last text, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to note verse 5. Going back to a text that we read earlier, Paul says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be where? In the faith. In the faith. So what is the purpose of our examination? To see if we're in the faith. That's right. To see if our understanding lines up with what is written. Prove what? Your own selves. Does it say, go prove the doctrine of your brother or sister? Go prove? Not necessarily. Does it mean we're not to do that? No. But it tells us specifically here we're to prove what? Our own selves. Why do I believe what I believe? We are to know. We are to prove it. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be what? Reprobate. What does it mean to be reprobate? Pretender. Pretender, okay. Probate um, comes from the Latin word which is associated with our English word, proof. Reprobate means that which is unproven. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it talks about, a, uh, in verse 28 specifically, it talks about a reprobate mind. Mm -hmm. That God gave the Gentiles, those who knew God but gave him not glory as God, he gave them over to a what kind of mind? A reprobate mind. That word reprobate literally means unproven. But more than that, it means a mind that is incapable of discerning between good and evil. It's incapable of judging. It can't judge. It doesn't discern. And so, God wants us to know of a certainty why we believe what we believe. He wants us to examine ourselves, prove our own selves, prove our faith, knowing that Jesus Christ is in us. And if not, we are what? reprobates. We don't have judgment. Christ is our judgment. He just says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John chapter 1, it says that that life was the light of men. Jesus wants to be the light of our lives. He wants to be our judgment, our discernment. And if we allow him into the heart, he will bring spiritual things and spiritual understanding 
because in this world we only have five senses as human beings. We see, we hear, we smell, we taste, and we touch. Those are the senses that we know the world around us. But heaven is not about sight or seeing or hearing or tasting or touching or smelling. Heaven is spiritual. The truths of the Word of God are spiritual. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And if we want to be a, have a spiritual discernment, if we want to understand spiritual things, we must have the Spirit of the Lord to understand them. Not only does it take the Spirit of the Lord to prophesy, but it takes the Spirit of the Lord to interpret. We can't interpret without it. We can't understand the words of God without the Spirit of Christ. And so my admonition to us today is let us, let us study. Let us give attention to educating ourselves in the truths of the Word of God and, and not just the Word of God, but understanding the world around us as well. Whether, as I mentioned before, whether it be science, math, history, whatever it may be, God wants us to use the knowledge that we have to win souls for Christ, to help set people's feet upon the foundation of the Word of God, to bring people to where they have confidence in the Word of God. And people will have confidence if they see that we have confidence. And how we answer, the manner that we answer, will inspire confidence in others. If you go back and you look at the histories, especially during the, the dark ages of, of the Roman Empire, story after story is told of, of those who went to the stake or went to their death. And their last answer, their response to their judges, brought conviction to the hearts of many. And many were converted as they witnessed the death of these martyrs. And the answer that they gave. The man who witnessed the death of Christ, the centurion who is responsible for putting him to death, realized that this man was the Son of God. The soldiers who put to death the Apostle Paul, history tells us, converted to Christianity and were themselves put to death because of the way the Apostle Paul met his death, the answer he gave. And God wants us to have that type of answer, an answer that will inspire faith and hope in the Word of God in the hearts of those that hear. And if that's your desire, if, if you want to have that answer, then I invite you to pray with me as we close in a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And dear Father, I pray that thy name may be hallowed in our hearts and minds this day, sanctified. I pray, Father, that thou wilt give us an answer, that, Father, we may apply our hearts and our minds to the study of thy word as never before, to understand the great truths that are therein. For only that foundation will keep us amidst the floods and the storms of this life. Only that foundation will stand sure in the scenes that are about to unfold in this world, to the calamities that are about to fall. Only those who know their God will be able to do exploits. Only they will be strong and Father, we want to be strong. When we are called to give an answer, we want to give an answer for Thee. We want our words to be such that it will inspire hope and courage and faith in the hearts of those that hear them. And Father, I pray that Thou will bless us to this end. Help us to study that we may be able to give that answer to those that hear. We pray that Thou mayest be sanctified in our hearts that we, Father, may make that needed preparation day and every day 
of our lives, that we may be prepared to give that answer, and in a way that will save souls and not turn them away. And we bless thee and thank thee, and do ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.